Well, good morning, uh, wherever you are as you tune in this morning. I know as I'm recording this, uh, there's a 60% chance that there will be rain on Sunday morning, and so uh, we need that rain, and so uh, Lord willing, we will get it. Um, of course, that'll make some inconveniences as far as our worshiping outside, but we have a contingency plan in place for that. But uh, wherever you are, I hope that you are finding peace and rest in Christ, who is the one true King. And as we gather this morning, He is the one that we gather to worship, to sing His praises, and to delight in His grace. And so I'm going to open us in a word of prayer, and then we'll look at God's Word uh, together once again. So let's pray together. Our gracious God and King, we do thank You, O Lord, that uh, we are uh, built upon the rock, the, the true foundation of Jesus Christ, the rock of our salvation. And that, Lord, foundation we know is an unshakable one, one uh, that cannot be moved, which has been established forever and which stands firmly. Because of what Christ has done, that he has come, that he has lived, that he has died for us, that we, O oh Lord, can have that assurance of hope and salvation, that though the world around us may crumble, we, O oh Lord, have a foundation that is sure and sound. So help us this morning as we gather to, to find that firm foundation once again, to have our feet firmly planted upon it, upon you and upon your holy word, that we, O oh Lord, might be instructed once again in your truth, that we might give you the glory and praise that is due to your name. Speak through me. Give me, O oh Lord, the words to speak and give all of us the words to hear, that you might be held high this morning, and that we, Lord, might delight in your word. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to be looking at Psalm 148 as we get closer to the end of our, our study of the Psalms. But uh, you all know the feeling, right? You, you walk out to the mailbox knowing that what awaits you is probably a pile of bills and junk mail that you'd rather not see. But there's always that hope that maybe something good awaits, maybe a refund check or uh, perhaps an encouraging note from an old friend, and so you, you go and you get your mail once again. But then you open the box, and there it is. In big, bold letters, jury summons. And of course, as you read those words, you're immediately overcome with that feeling of dread, knowing what an inconvenience this is going to cause to your life. And you begin to think of all the excuses that uh, you might have for why that particular date on this notice is not going to work for you. I mean, wasn't that the week that we were going to go on vacation? Or wasn't that the week that I was going to go visit a long-lost friend that I haven't spoken to for years? And the reality is, as far as you're concerned, that you won't ever have the time to do something like this. Of course, I know some of you actually enjoy uh, jury duty, and if so, I commend you. But for most people, a summons to appear is not a welcome invitation, but rather viewed as a burdensome bother that we would rather find a way out rather than to do it. 
The reason I share that example with you this morning is that you're about to be given a summons. Actually, you have already been given a summons. No, not to appear at the county courthouse, but to appear before the righteous judge and king of all the universe, the one true and living God whom the psalmist, as we will see, calls us, summons us to praise this morning. And so we're going to read together Psalm 148. This is the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For He commanded and they were created and He established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord. For his name alone is exalted, his majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints, for the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord. Well, this is the word of our God. Thanks be to God for his holy and inerrant word. So we have here another psalm that is calling upon God's people and all people to praise the Lord. It's the third of the five doxological psalms that close uh, the book of Psalms, as uh, we have noted, uh, that these five psalms uh, end the book of Psalms with this very strong note of praise, right? Each one begins and ends with that exclamation, praise the Lord or hallelujah, which is both a universal expression for people of every nation, every language group to praise God, but also, as we've discussed, a call to attention for all people to do that which they are created to do, which is to worship God. And that's what the psalmist is calling us to do once again in this psalm. It's a, a call to, to, to pay attention and to actively once again engage in the worship of God. But this particular psalm, as commentators have pointed out, is not just an invitation for anyone who is interested to join in this worship. No, rather, it is, as we said, a summons. It is a requirement that is incumbent upon all who hear to come and worship God, a, a summons issued to all but to appear before the righteous judge and king and to fulfill our obligation, our privilege to worship before him. And so uh, we're going to look at this passage in two parts. First, a summons for all creation to praise God, and secondly, a summons for all people to praise God. So to begin with, a summons for all creation to praise God. And as I've already mentioned, right, the psalmist begins with that exclamation, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And then as he proceeds in this particular psalm, he 
begins to call upon all of creation to do so and detailing who and what must praise the Lord. It says, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise Him, all His angels, praise Him, sun and moon, praise Him, all you shining stars, praise Him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. He's calling upon the great expanse of the heavens and everything in it, including the angels, to praise God. Right to, to do that which all creation was ultimately created to do, which is to worship God. And we, as we make our way through this psalm, right, we hear that language of Genesis 1, the account of creation, right? Even the, the detail of Genesis 1-7, right? The, the waters above the heavens, and, and he goes on, right, not only to describe the expanse of the heavens, but in verses 7 and following, he uh, describes the earth and everything in it, right? Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, in other words, nothing of God's creation is excluded from the obligation to praise its creator. Right? Everything in the heavens and the earth, everything under the earth, everything in the sky, land, and sea, everything that is animate and inanimate has an obligation to worship God. Why? Because God created all things, and therefore all things have an obligation to worship Him. And He is the only one who is worthy of that worship, that allegiance as the creator of all things. And of course, verse 5 gives us a description of that awesome power by which God created all things. Verse 5, he says, For he commanded, and they were created. Again, right, this comes from the creation account in Genesis 1, where we see that God spoke, and it was. God created all things out of nothing, and he did so by the word of his power, right? He spoke them into existence. Let there be light. Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and so on. It's an amazing thing to consider that God brought all things into existence by speaking them into existence. But not only did he speak all things into existence, Hebrews 1, 3 tells us he upholds them. He upholds them by the word of his power. Uh, it says actually, right, speaking of Christ, that he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And the psalmist, uh, though using different words, re refers to this uh, sustaining power of God. In verse 6, when he talks about he established them forever and ever, he gave a decree and it shall not pass away, that God preserves all things by the power of his word. And to those who hear this psalmist describe these things, we are left to say, how can we not worship such a God who created all things by the word of his power, who sustains all things by the word of his power? But of course, the emphasis in this particular psalm is 
Not so much on the reasons why we ought to worship God, of which there are numerous, but the obligation that we have, that all of creation has to worship God. And I like how uh, it's a pastor named Roy Clements uh, summarizes the, the comprehensiveness of which, by which the psalmist identifies creation's obligation to worship God. James Boyce uh, shares this in his commentary, and it says this, that the psalmist explores just about every area of human knowledge to catalog the potential members of his cosmic congregation. He begins in the field of cosmology, angels, stars, and waters above the skies. Then when he has satisfied himself that he has exhausted the celestial realm, he turns to the terrestrial, marine biology, meteorology, geomorphology, dendrology, zoology, and orthonology, and so on. You can go back and look up all those words uh, later. But the point is that everything, all of creation, is obligated to worship God as their king, as their creator. Uh, recently, uh, in my home, that my children have been studying the ocean and uh, everything in it, all the creatures uh, that live in it. And uh, you can imagine there's quite a variety of these amazing creatures uh, that live in the ocean, some, of course, that we would never actually want to come into contact with face-to-face. -face. Um, but, but just about every day, one of them will come and excitedly tell me about the most recent uh, creature that they learned about, right? Barracudas, flying fish, um, you know, different poisonous sea snakes, of course. Um, and, and all of these amazing creatures, you know, and, and to think, right, that God created them all. Why? To worship Him, that all creatures of our God and King would worship Him. And that's what the psalmist is saying here, that all creatures, everything in the ocean, everything in the land, the sea, the heavens, and the earth, from the trenches to the sunlight zone, my children will understand that reference, are created by God to worship God. They are created for the glory of God. And of course, so are you and I. And we'll get to that in a moment. But this identification of the different aspects of creation um, is so important, not, not only because it identifies God as the creator of all things and therefore the obligation that all things have to worship God, to submit to God, to recognize His authority, His proper place, but also because God is the only proper object of worship. Right? Worshiping anything other than God is unacceptable, and, of course, futile. You see, as we read this list of God's creation, we realize the reality is that people have always, since the time of the fall, been drawn to worship and serve these other things, right? To worship and serve the creature rather than the creator, as Romans 1 tells us, right? And so many of the things that the psalmist identifies as those things that were created by God to worship God were actually used by uh, the people of the ancient world as objects of worship, right? Uh, the angels, the sun, the moon, the stars, the mountains, the hills, the trees, uh, the beasts of the field, the creeping things on the ground, the, the birds of the sky, even the creatures of the deep have all 
been used in some form as objects of worship. All right, we remember the story of Abraham, for example, who was from Ur of the Chaldeans, who most likely worshipped a moon god before God intervened in his life and uh, called him out into covenant relationship with him to worship God. And of course, we know it doesn't end with Abraham, nor did it begin with Abraham, uh, but it continues even throughout history. And of course, we know the story that God's people continued to struggle with idolatry, worshiping the creation rather than the creator, right? We can look at the story of the golden calf, for example, in Exodus 32, when the Israelites grew impatient while Moses was on the mountain of God and Aaron fashioned an idol for them to worship. We know later on in under the leadership of King Josiah in 2 Kings 23, 4 and 5, that he had to remove the priests who were leading the people in worship of idols, uh, burning incense to Baal, to the sun and the moon and the constellations and all the host of the heavens. And of course, we could cite other examples from the Old Testament, but it's you know not just limited to the Old Testament. It's found in the New Testament as well, as I mentioned Romans 1 earlier. Right, which says in verses 22 and 23, claiming to be wise, they, speaking of mankind, became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Idolatry, once again. And of course, we know that this type of idolatry is not limited to those who lived long ago, but it's very much present today, isn't it? No, we may not worship graven images, right, or idols of, of various creatures, though that does still exist in parts of the world, but we do worship and serve the creature rather than the creator sometimes, don't we? I mean, we know of the deification of angels. We know of looking to the stars for guidance and direction in life. But most importantly, we know our own heart. And we know that our own heart, as it has been said, are perpetual idol factories. We know that we are constantly drawn to Look for alternatives to God. Something that will bring us more immediate satisfaction, perhaps, to our longings. Something that perhaps will put us in a better light to those around us. Or as one commentator put it, we are constantly putting our own interests and desires before God's. We know of the excuses that we ourselves make to not answer the summons that has been put out to us to worship God, to submit us ourselves to God in all things. Right? We understand what the psalmist is getting at here. No, we may not have a physical idol that we carry around and worship, but we do have those things, don't we, in our lives, those situations, whether at home or at work or in other social settings where we do put our own interests, our own desires before God. So we have to ask ourselves, what are those things 
that we value in this world more than we value a vital living relationship with the covenant-keeping God, the living God? Is it our possessions? Is it our financial security? Is it our reputation? Is it some relationship other than our relationship with God? The psalmist, by the inspiration of the Spirit, is telling us, don't do it. Don't worship and, and serve the creature rather than the creator. Don't submit yourself to that futility of worshiping that other than God. It can only lead to heartache and pain. God is the only one worthy of our worship. Dear friends, God is the creator of all things and therefore the only one worthy of our worship, our affections. He is the only one that we ought to love and, and serve most fully. And of course, this is not just an invitation, is it? It is a, a command as we mentioned earlier, which brings us to our second point, a summons for all people to praise God. Verse 11 and following, the psalmist identifies who is required to praise the Lord. He says, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. And so after detailing the different parts of creation, making it clear that all of creation must submit itself and worship to God, the psalmist now focuses on the capstone of creation mankind, and makes it clear as well that all men are required to worship the Lord. There is no one too important or not important enough, no one too old or too young. Everyone, man or woman, is required to praise their God and Creator, right? Because He is the one who gives us life, who created us and sustains us and is the only one worthy of our worship and affection, regardless of our age, gender, or social status. We are all called to worship the one true King, the one true and living God. All of us, without exception, have receive that summons to appear. But again, as Romans 1, 21 makes clear, some do not respond to that summons, right? We, we read there uh, the words of the Apostle Paul, although they knew God, they did not honor Him as one or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. In fact, we read in Romans 1, they don't just not respond to the summons. They suppress it. They hide that it ever existed or try to. Right? They, they suppress the truth of God that has been revealed to them. They do this in unrighteousness, as Romans 1.18 says, and worship and serve the creature rather than the Creator. So the question to all who are listening is, what have you done with your summons to appear? How do you respond to the call which we actually formally give it every Lord's Day when we call the people of God 
to worship God? How do you respond to that call to gather on the Lord's Day, every Lord's Day, and worship Him? Do you respond willingly and joyfully to, to come and to worship God? Do you view it as a privilege to worship God? Or do you find excuses to find reasons to skirt our responsibility? Well, the psalmist tells us some, or, or well, God's Word teaches us that some will not respond to the summons. There are some who will respond to the summons to praise. And they are those that verse 14 identifies as His saints, the people of Israel who are near to Him. And here again we see that beautiful covenant language of God's nearness to His people. The, the language that we find, for example, in Deuteronomy 4, 7, and 8, for what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon Him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? You see, the Lord is near to His own. He is near to those who trust in Him. Those who live in light of His promises. Those whom He has called to Himself and worked in their hearts in such a way that they hear and respond and believe those promises of God. Those who have not only received the general call of God that goes out to all men, but the special call of God, the effectual call, as theologians call it, the effectual call of God to respond to the things of God, to freely and willingly come because of the work of God's Spirit in our hearts to desire that which glorifies God and believe the gospel and gather to worship their God and King. For these, the psalmist says, he has raised up a horn for his people, as verse 14 says. It's that same horn that Zechariah prophesied about in Luke chapter 1, verse 69 and following. And Zechariah said, He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. This, dear friends, is what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. He has not only summoned us, but he has saved us. He has delivered us from our enemies, sin and death and Satan through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, through Jesus' obedience on our behalf, his obedient life, his atoning death, so that we, by grace, through faith in him, might worship and serve him all of our days. 
No, not by our own strength, but by the strength of him who works in us to will and to work according to his good pleasure. You see, the summons has gone out to all the earth, and you have received your summons. So let us respond to the call to worship and serve God all of our days. Let us not be those who suppress that summons or look for excuses or think we're too busy or that somehow it doesn't apply to us. But let us, because of the great work which Christ has done for us and his spirit that works in our hearts even now, let us be those who delight in the privilege that we have to love and serve him all of our days and let us praise him for who he is and what he has done. Do that which we were created to do both today and every day and let us look forward, brothers and sisters, to that future day, that glorious future day when every nation, every tribe and tongue and race will gather before him, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And those who trust in him by grace through faith in Jesus Christ will sing hallelujah and praise the Lord together forevermore. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, we do thank you, Lord, for that work of grace that you have done in our lives, that you have indeed saved us. You have saved us from our sin, and you have given us new life in Jesus Christ through his obedient life and his sacrificial death on our behalf. And you, O oh Lord, are still at work in our hearts even now. Help us, O oh Lord, to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ this day and every day. That by your Spirit, O oh Lord, we would desire to live all of our days before your face, to worship and serve you forevermore. We thank you, O oh Lord, for this time. And we ask, O oh Lord, for you to strengthen us as we go from here, that we might give you the glory and praise that is due your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So please stand now for the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of of the Holy Spirit. Amen.